This astaxanthin supplement, I hear it 6,000 times stronger than vitamin C, 100 times stronger than vitamin E, and 800 times stronger than CoQ10? Yes, astaxanthin supports joint health, memory health, even anti-aging and immune health. This Hawaii brand delivers three times more nature-identical astaxanthin to your body and is a better buy than the competition. It's called Xanthacin. Safely manage your inflammatory health with Xanthacin. It's pure and highly absorbed, providing greater benefits. Visit GetXantho.com and these retailers. Well, how's it going, everybody? Another edition of Hawaii Football. Now, we're already up to episode 13, lucky number 13 here, as we move on to the final week of the UH football season. Kind of hard to believe here we are 14 weeks later uh, as Hawaii will wrap up their season with a road trip to the Mountain Time Zone, which hasn't always necessarily been the most friendly of road trips for the University of Hawaii. They will take on Wyoming. They will be riding a little bit of momentum coming up with win number five on the season, a wild one against Colorado State that we'll get into here in just a second. Jordan and Hunter back with you. And Hunter, it's Thanksgiving week, so mm-hmm. happy Thanksgiving to you and the family. Well, man. Um, but we got to we gotta get the, the important details out of the way before we can get into the nitty-gritty of this podcast. Uh, what's Thanksgiving kind of like for you and, and yours? Do you have sort of a go-to? Like, what's your power? Are you a turkey guy? Are you not a turkey guy? Well, prime rib, like what, what's the equation look like on Thanksgiving for you and, and the, the meal in front of you? The, uh, the Hughes household uh, were big uh, ham people. I don't know if it was my mom not wanting to attack the turkey. <laughs> uh, you know, tur- cooking turkeys is somewhat of a, an adventure. So hams were usually uh, in front of us on Thanksgiving. Uh Regardless, I, I really could care less about the meat as long as they're sweet potatoes. That is the only thing that I'm focused on come Thanksgiving is preferably mashed sweet potatoes with some brown sugar on top. Um, and then if I'm lucky, maybe some apple pie or pumpkin pie at the end. But really, the sweet potatoes is why I'm there, Jordan. I'm tapping in for that. And that's about it. How about you, man? What do you guys do over on Maui? Yeah, it's kind of a mixture. Like, I wouldn't say we have a set deal every year. The turkey does get kind of involved, right? If if you're making it, um, a lot of the, you know, you got restaurants, you got grocery stores that sort of uh, offer up the pack, like the package deal. Sometimes we do that. Usually some ham is involved. Um, But there's usually turkey of some sort, like whether it's made by somebody else or if we kind of take it upon ourselves uh, to actually cook the bird um it's a pretty traditional spread i gotta be honest like there isn't a whole lot of um outside the box with our thanksgiving spread you know we got we got turkey we got stuff and i'm a big mashed potatoes guy so as long as there's like potatoes involved um uh, whether it's with ham whether it's with turkey some prime rib whatever um mashed potatoes i'm i'm all about it right because in hawaii like it's it's usually rice right it's usually rice yeah. and mac salad of some yeah. sort which there is nothing wrong with that don't get me wrong um, but you know, I'm I could eat the whole tray. I could eat the entire tray of sweet potatoes. I really think so. Oh yeah. Some sweet Done. potatoes, some mashed potatoes, get it, get, bring it. Uh, yeah. I'm all for that. So yeah, it's, uh, it'll be fun to look forward to. Uh, we want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving as well. Uh, all of the loyal listeners and uh, new listeners who may be joining us here on whatever platform, uh, you have found us here on Hawaii football now presented by Xanthison. Mahalo also to our sponsor spectrum mobile. All right, Hunter, let's dive into it. Uh, Hawaii picks up a win on senior night, which always makes it a little bit sweeter, as they said aloha to about 17 guys playing their last home game for the University of Hawaii. And it's a 50 to 45 (laughs) final score against Colorado State, two teams that quite honestly came in with similar situations. Two teams struggling, two teams not going to a bowl game, two teams whose offenses had left a lot to be desired, and two teams whose defenses actually had been playing pretty well. Uh, and what do you get? You get 95 total points on the board. And I'm sure there were a lot of people out there saying, well, that's that's the offense we've been waiting for, right? 535 total yards of offense. Chevin Cordero throws for 406, runs for another. I think his net was around 35 or so. Throws for a couple of touchdowns, runs for another. They run for 129 yards as a team. That ain't bad. They average darn near seven yards per play. They score in every quarter. Um, And so the question, Hunter, that I'm sure other people have asked you, 
that people have asked me, that people have just asked themselves and, and their friends around the water cooler. Uh, where has this been all year? Man, I, I have no answers and I'm, I'm still searching. Uh, you know, you, you look at this and we've been able to kind of fall back on our defense the entire year. Um, but then honestly, Jordan, if you look at the stats right now, had we not forced the turnovers the way, the way that we did, we squeaked out another one against Colorado state right now. Cause it seemed like they kind of along with us, this game could kind of score at will. It seemed like, um, I mean, their quarterback went for five twenty-seven, five touchdowns. He had two picks. Um, yeah, I, th- th- this was so uncharacteristic of, the first three quarters of our season. Um, our, our good friend and, and friend of the show, Mark Veneri, uh, you know, was, was talking to me and, and said, Hey, this is the first game that uh, Bo Graham, the OC is actually calling plays from up top, which um, me personally, just uh, at, from my, my quarterback background and being able to see uh, what the defense is throwing at you, that is a hundred times easier to see, when you're not at field level. So that move right off the bat, uh, even if you're not that gifted of a play caller helps you. So I was, uh, I was thankful that they kind of changed that up right there. Um, I don't know if I can say that's entirely the reason for all of our offensive success, but I think it's worth mentioning, but um, yeah, man, we got it done on the ground and in the air. Um, So man, I, I just, uh, I would like to say I'd like to see this uh, this path continue, but I think it was just a uh, a little spike in the road for us. Yeah, we'll see. They'll, they'll get another opportunity right this coming week yep. against Wyoming if they can start to build something. Um, and, and so this is a, 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 an offensive performance that I, I'm sure some people will look at and say, like, well, I mean, Colorado State's three and seven, right? They're now a three and eight football team, so they can't be any good. Uh, And there's some truth in that, but I do think there's a little more context, right? This is a Rams defense that came in in their previous 10 games, their 10 games so far this season. They're only giving up 23.7 points per game. Uh, And so it it had not been the defensive problem why they were three and seven. And so, yeah, it's a subpar team, but it is a pretty quality defense, at least on paper that Hawaii went out and, you know, dropped basically 43. The defense chips in once again. They've now got five defensive scores on the season. So we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, but, yeah. but I thought, you know, just observing and, and how aggressive Hawaii came out right, right out of the gate, yeah. uh, mixing in some quick throws, some, some high percentage completion throws to get Chevin Cordero comfortable. They do settle for field goals on those first three drives, but those three drives, right. They took seven plays, eight plays, seven plays. Like they were moving the ball. They were stringing together plays. Um, which maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but just a week prior against UNLV, we were lamenting at just how inefficient Hawaii was at just getting first downs, like stringing together yes. drives. And, yes. and you thought, okay, maybe, right, progress, but not all the way quite there because you're leaving a lot of points on the board, right? I mean, those three field goals as drives stall out after those lengthy plays uh, or after those le- lengthy succession of plays. It's like, well, you're leaving 12 points on the board, right? And how, lo- hard lo- um, how large is that going to loom in what we thought was maybe going to be a low-scoring game? I was completely wrong. Uh, in that prognostication. So, so what did you see differently Hunter in terms of how they went about um, attacking it? And really quite honestly, I thought making Chevin Cordero the focal point of how they were going to attack as opposed to being a run first downhill, physical hit you in the mouth type of offense. Like it seemed like there was at least more of a plan to put the ball in Chevin's hands and let him be that guy to distribute. And when things break down, we saw him kind of break out the the, the magic wand again and, and make some plays outside of the pocket, which he has been so good at so far in his career. But, but, but I just kind of curious what, what your observations were and in, in how Shevin seemed to be much more a starting point for this offense as opposed to a complimentary piece. Yeah, no, it, it reminded me a little bit of how the Seahawks operate their offense. Obviously, they're um, very much – somewhat of a run and kind of a, an option first team and then let Russ extend plays with his feet. And then obviously he can throw that great deep ball. Um, it reminded me a little bit of that just with how Shevin would um, get rid of the ball quickly. And then whenever stuff did break down, he was elusive and got it down on the ground um, and got around the edge um, outside of the pocket and extended plays. So 
Um, other than a few, you know, stuff at the beginning with some of the shorter, uh, the shorter route concepts, a lot of the stuff that was successful, you know, the, the big throw to, to Bowens, the, what was that 94, 96 yard pass on the sideline was a broken play that Chev extended and we were able to um, flip the script on him right there. So that was kind of my read right there. And whenever you start landing a couple of these throws that um, that linebacker core and some of those safeties have to kind of honor those plays and then you're able to run underneath that, which so, you know, that's what was so successful with the run and shoot. They have to honor the deep ball. And so you can run underneath it. Great running teams usually happen because it's opened up by the pass. So that was kind of my read there. Um, we were not perfect to say the least um, fumbling the ball. Um, Chev did a good job, not throwing uh, interceptions uh, halfway decent, in my opinion, uh, as far as accuracy, 23 of 41, um, 400 yards in the ground. I mean, in the air, uh, any day of the week is going to be pretty good. That's, that's a pretty good day in the office. Um, but uh, yeah, I just felt like again, Hawaii, is kind of uh, asked to make do with what we have. And uh, they, uh, our grit and determination showed out uh, in this game against Colorado State. Yeah, and, and you mentioned Zion Bowens, who had himself quite the, the coming out party, Unreal. if you will. He goes six for 172 yards receiving and one touchdown. Um, you also mentioned, you know, it wasn't perfect, right? There were some pretty big drops, like Nick Marner had one on the sideline. Uh, Fiso had one Calvin Turner had one where he's hit in stride like you couldn't yeah. throw a better ball you know running uh, a little little inside post or, or whatever it was and he catches it and it's him and one guy who he's got two steps on in a foot race from 50 yards out or so who knows how many yards if not going all the way that could have gone for um, and then you know the day day hunter 10 carries just 22 yards did have a catch Diedrich Parson 11 carries 78 yards a little more productive from him. He had the two touchdowns as well. And as, as we mentioned, Chevin on the ground, 34 net yards um, yeah. after you include the sack yardage, 14 rushes in total and the touchdown. Um, you had Calvin Turner, seven catches, 94 yards. Nick Martiner, five catches, 97 yards and the touchdown, that big one uh, there in the third quarter, little nice move to the outside and uh, Zion Bowens, the 172 total yards. And so, it was again, Shevin spreading the ball around a little bit, but it was a situation for the University of Hawaii where once again, right, it's about five core guys that, that, that kind of make things happen, right? We didn't, really didn't see much of Jared Smart. Uh, the only other catch came on a shovel pass to Hikilikili Iliki. Um, and so, you know, you were seeing like the shovel pass, you were seeing some some double moves out there, you were seeing all kinds of different things. And, and it was a situation where, you know, they, 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 they seem to open things up a little bit more. And, um, you know, the, the fact that offensive coordinator Bo Graham was actually upstairs, he was in the coaches box for the first time during the game since the opener at UCLA. And, and this was a topic of conversation we had during the game, but um, you know, does, does that make a, a huge difference? Does that make much of a difference or, or what, what can be gained or lost by doing that? If, if you're the offensive play caller Hunter, by, by not being there down on the sideline and instead being, being upstairs with the bird's eye view. Yeah. It has everything to do with your, um, your relationship to the guys, how, what your style of coaching is. Uh, Rolo would call plays directly from the sideline. Um, a big part of uh, looking at defenses from the run and shoot was, was picking up uh, postures of the DBs. And so uh, being down there on the field, you, you can see that you don't have to be up top to know what they're, what they're throwing at you. Um, the other thing, Bo Graham is the quarterback's coach. So being down on the field has an advantage of being able to talk to your starter in Shevin. definitely whenever they were playing Cameron uh, Shager, uh, different times throughout the year, you want to be able to talk to your young quarterback, get feedback from him. What is he seeing? Talk about strategy as we move forward throughout the game. So there are advantages to both being down on the sideline, but then obviously being up in the um, in the booth, you're, you're looking at it from a bird's eye view and you're seeing X and X's and O's and not really a part of the emotion of the sideline quite as much. So it is a much different dynamic being up there. Um, I, I, from what I observed, uh, the times where I've been on the sideline, 
can't always tell if Bo Graham is entirely calling the plays or if he's waiting to hear from his dad <laughs> what the call is on the field. Um, Cause obviously as head coach, you have executive control over what gets called on the field. So um, I, I also wonder if that element was included too, with him being down the sideline within literally just a shoulder ear earshot of his dad. Hey, no, we're, we're running this instead. So um, again, you can do that with the headset too, but I, I think it's worth mentioning. I I'm not entirely sure who the executive play calling responsibility actually falls to with this offense. Yeah. And, and to be fair, that, that wouldn't be terribly unique. Like head coaches do have that veto power. Um, you know, I, I know of other instances of different programs, you know, you, sometimes you get deep- Rolo took over seriously. Like, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that, there's a great example, right? Yeah, Stutz and and Schmitty would would call plays. Uh, Schmitty would be up in the booth. Stutz would be down with us on the sideline. But anytime it was situational time, <laughs> you might as well have shut off their uh, their headsets because Rolo called everything. So you're exactly right. So the situation times they 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 take control. Yeah, and so for, for this group, right, one last question on the offense before we get to a defense that had some pretty stellar performances, even though yeah. they gave up the 45 points. It's one of those weird ones. Um, if you can take some of the strong elements of Saturday's performance into next week's game or this coming week's game at Wyoming, what of the performances or schematics or, or whatever you want to take do you think kind of lends itself like, Hey, that is something concrete that this group should look to expand on. Um, You know, Zion Bowen's his breakout uh, getting Cordero a little more freedom to, to operate the, you know, spreading things out the way that he did really didn't involve much of a tight end, um, you know, in the passing game. I know Phillips was out there, Kili Leaky a little bit, Um, but where would you kind of take and build uh, for this last game at Wyoming, if anything? I mean, it, it's uh, one last time for this group of guys to play together. Um, th- this past game, we were really, you and I were talking about last week, uh, kind of what the spirit of the team is going to look like with uh, bowl eligibility being off the table, uh, some guys already entering transfer portal, and this coaching staff, which is very much a my where a highway type of an organization, really wondered how the guys were going to stick together. Um with this being able to hang a number up there, a very high number, 50 points, um, it's encouraging. Uh, definitely as a defense, looking over and being like, hey, the offense is doing their job. Finally, we're doing our job. Um, maybe we can finish this thing strong uh, one last time for the boys. Um, that's kind of one thing that I look to. And then definitely just from a quarterback's perspective, um, Shevin had a great game. Yeah, like the, the fumbles uh, – are not always his fault. You know, the, the pocket collapsing and stuff like that can, uh, can happen. But uh, anytime that you can have 400 in the air, you feel good going into the next week. Yeah. And, and you mentioned from a defensive perspective, right? It, it's kind of nice. It's a little freeing when you don't have to hold a team to 10 yes. points or something like that, right? You don't have to come up with stop after stop after stop to win a football game. You don't have to force six turnovers, right? To, to spring a home win and and look this team continues to force turnovers at a really high clip right yeah. they give up 45 points it, it's kind of one of those weird ones they only gave up 10 at halftime right Hawaii had built that 19 point lead heck they had led it by as many as 26 early in the third quarter and so a defense that that only gave up 17 points three quarters in and then kind of a wild fourth quarter where Colorado State <laughs> scores four touchdowns Hawaii had 10 tackles for loss or excuse me 11 tackles for loss in this game they have five sacks three more takeaways the total is now up to 27 which keeps them at number three overall nationally right only behind Cincinnati and uh it's like Nevada or Ohio State or somebody mixed in there um two interceptions one they took back to the house their fifth defensive score of the season that also ranks number three nationally um you know force three total fumbles recover one of them uh, Darius Musel forced all three of the fumbles. <laughs> he had 13 tackles, which now puts him over 100 for the season. Back-to-back years, he's got over 100 tackles. Uh, Corey Paredes and Jelani Tavai, the only other two guys to do that in the last couple of decades. Uh, two sacks, two and a half tackles for loss. Again, three forced fumbles. He broke up a pass. Uh, so as you would imagine, he was in the running and ended up being named 
Mountain West Conference Defensive Player of the Week. Uh, mm. He's done it. Corey Bethley's done it a couple of times. Like those two guys are quite special. And, and yeah. Bethley, six tackles, a sack, another tackle for loss, uh, a pick, hit the quarterback one time. Uh, like they, they, those guys, I know we talk about them week in and week out, but, um, it is, it is quite the treat to watch. Like it, it especially and Darius Musa and look, this is to take nothing away from him. Um, because he has been terrific and is kind of the next guy in a long line of really good middle linebackers for Hawaii and his versatility yeah. and the way he gets after the quarterback maybe is a little mu- different than what we have seen from some other guys. Uh, but Corey Bethley in that hybrid position, call him a safety, call him whatever you want, right? Um, he is having like a, and some other folks have thrown this out there, but like all American, quite honestly, an all American type season. Yeah. And I, I, I try it. We, I know I do try to stay away, uh, away from the hyperbole a little bit, but like he is doing this every single week. He's already got a national defensive player of the week. Uh, award right multiple in the same week after that fresno state game but he really is like it's kind of hard to not downplay how good this guy has been oh totally and uh we we don't say that lightly uh you know dropping something like all american in there but when when you go week in week out you're top five now in the entire country for uh interceptions um, you look at what he's doing uh, tackle wise too. Um, he's even getting in the backfield and causing uh, causing sacks. Um, he reminds me uh, a lot of Trayvon Henderson, my teammate. Uh, just phenomenal football IQ, uh, and the ball just finds him. He's in the right place at the right time. Great instincts, and uh, yeah, those two man uh, that th- that duo that they are the the spark of our team and in a lot of ways uh, where the offense if i can be candid outside of maybe calvin turner the offense lacks a leader they they lack a leader you can tell just being on the sideline no one's really getting in anybody's face trying to light everybody up um 53 and 5 are the leaders of that team and they it's it's so apparent with their performance, and um, they've uh, they've they've held us in games that we didn't really belong in in other parts of uh, the season. Uh, quite frankly, just by their performances uh, on their own. So, yeah, I I think we as fans need to uh, be thankful uh, for however much longer they're here because uh, both of them have the skills uh, to get to the, the next level. Absolutely. Chimo Azuna, uh, one of his most productive games. He has 10 tackles. Uh, Cortez Davis broke up three passes. I, I thought he played pretty well. And again, the, the end numbers are a little ugly. Like they give up 651 yards of total offense, 527 yards to Dodd Centeo, uh, who came in quite honestly with some pretty poor <laughs> passing numbers. But yeah. again, a lot of it came uh, as they were in desperation catch up mode. Um, and, and so uh, just kind of finishing the, the conversation, Hunter, on. Darius and, and Corey Bethley in particular. And, and I think part of what makes them resonate right with, with local fans, like they're a little undersized for their positions. They're kind of tweeners. Um, they present physically a lot of versatility from a skill set and a physical standpoint. Like you can line Darius up at, at any of these linebacker spots. He can play that uh, rush end, almost get after the quarterback. Corey Bethley can play anywhere from on the line of scrimmage. He's covering some of these good tight ends. He, he, he's dropping in the zone coverage uh, basically at all three levels. And so, you know, we, we, we talk about this coaching staff and, and offensively we've lamented a lot on whether the, the vision fits the skill set on that side of the football. I think you can have a similar conversation and it, it is matched up much more harmoniously where Todd Graham's defense and how he likes to move guys around and how he likes to play aggressively and how he can utilize some of these tweener dudes in Muasau and Bethley, and not only from their skill set, but also their their smarts, right? They're, those are smart football players. And to, to do what Todd Graham is asking them to do in, in multiple positions and, and last minute changes at the line of scrimmage, like you got to be a pretty sharp dude. And those two guys sort of operating their ends, the front end and the back end of the defense. Um, what have you made of how 
Todd Graham's system has sort of brought out what he has brought out production wise from those two guys. Yeah. I mean, our record may not show it, but we're a top five defense in the entire country, just in terms of takeaways. Um, the, the, the unfortunate thing is defense doesn't always win games. Um, they, they can keep you in games. Offense needs to win it for you. A lot of times um, it's uh, it, it goes hand in hand with his reputation as a coach. You know, he's a defensive minded coach. Um, and if you're, uh, a group of five, you know, type of talent um, that that wants to come and and play somewhere that that's going to be celebrated. It looks like at least in Coach Graham's tenure out here, this is the spot. If you want to come and be a linebacker, uh, be that kind of cover two trash safety, um, drop down safety that Corey Bethley's kind of playing for us. Um, this is the place, and um, it's almost a weird comfort watching our team, even though. You know, we had 45 points scored against us. I still feel really confident in our defense because we we can force turnovers. We can uh, spice it up. I, I always have that kind of a comfort watching our defense. I've never feel like we're necessarily that far out of football games just because of what they've been able to do. So a lot of that hats off to Coach Graham and what uh, that defense has been able to accomplish. Yeah, it's been quite impressive. Uh, special teams also kind of a bright spot. Like Matt Shipley uh, was terrific punting the football. I know he ends up missing a field goal, I, I think, at one point, but uh, did knock in just about every other kick. And, and he and Ryan Stonehouse were putting on a show from a punting standpoint. And then you had uh, Jalen Perdue, who another guy, where did he come from? Where's this guy been, right? Defensive back from Lancaster, California, Antelope Valley College transfer, um barely played at all last year i think he missed all but the new mexico bowl due to injury uh five kickoff returns for 112 yards with a long of 37 um hadn't really seen him return kicks until saturday and uh, he provided a nice little spark so that might be a little something for for this group to to use and build on if, if he can give you that in the return game that's that's not a bad place to be yeah no and uh, for the majority of the year our strategy on kickoff has been uh, kneel it in the end zone, take the 25 yards. But um, if you're even able to get one extra yard outside of the 25, there's something about kickoff similar to the way that defense can kind of charge the team. The whole team is involved, both offense and defense guys are pulled from those groups to make up special teams. And so, um, as like a core unit, everybody's involved with special teams. And so if you're able to get anything done productively, everyone's involved there. So it can really charge a team very quickly and turn the momentum on uh, for offense or defense, depending on what happens. So I'm a big fan of that. Uh, put a guy back there that's hungry. I'm sure he's been getting it done in practice too. Um, and uh, yeah, I like that. Uh, good plays can come from anyone. It doesn't just have to come from your, your core group of maybe five guys. Yeah, it was a, it was a fun senior night. That's for sure. Uh, pretty good crowd on hand. I mean, the numbers weren't eye popping or anything like that. Another crowd in the, the 5,000 range, uh, but just wanted to mention the seniors who they honored uh, the 17, I believe it was, was the total number before we close out uh, our first half segment on this 13th edition of Hawaii football. Now you had quarterback Kamali'i Akina, who had been in this program for a number of years, uh, linebacker Peyton Awaya, the Ka uh, Kalani graduate, defensive back Chima Azuna, defensive back Colby Burton, uh, wide receiver Aaron Cephas, defensive back Cortez Davis, defensive back Eugene Ford, DB Quinton Frazier uh, at that spur position, defensive lineman Alema Kapoi, the local boy. You got the tight end, H-back, running back, whatever you wanted to call him. Uh, Hikili Kili'iliki, who had an, uh, a reception on that shovel pass on senior night. Offensive lineman Cole Leval um, out of Washington State. Defensive lineman Dewan Matthews. Offensive lineman Gene Pryor. Uh, you had Jared Smart. Defensive lineman Derek Thomas and Pita Tonga, as well as Calvin Turner Jr. being honored after the game, which is always a pretty special sight to see. All right, we're going to take our halftime break here. But, of course, we do want to remind you, about our good up friends over at Xanthacin. And of course, Astaxanthin, uh, recommended by doctors and pharmacists for all of its anti-aging qualities, better cholesterol health, better cognitive function. Like if you, if you need help with just about anything, 
Heck, give it a try. It's got more astaxanthin than just about any of the other competitors. And again, that's xanthacin. You can get that at getxantho.com, Newtown Square Pharmacy, down to earth in Kaka'ako. You can get that as well at Pharmacare Hawaii. And also check out getxantho.com to learn more information. All right, second half coming your way. We'll look ahead to Wyoming, as well as some of the bigger storylines as we uh, basically getting ready to head into the off season. We'll be back with more here on Hawaii Football Now. This is Hawaii Football Now from ESPN Honolulu. All right, second half time here on HFN. Jordan Hunter back with you. Final game of the year, Hawaii trying to finish 6-7, and seven, currently sitting at 5-7. and seven. Uh, And the final game of the year will be for the Paniolo Trophy. That's right. Wyoming, another match of 26th all-time meeting against the Cowboys. And the 26th edition will take place up in Laramie once again, just like it did last year. Cowboys holding the Paniolo Trophy via that 31-7 to seven win last season. Kickoff scheduled for 10 a.m. Hawaii time. Uh, and the last time Hawaii won a game in Laramie, 1991, right? Former old WAC rivals, bit of a hiatus in this longstanding rivalry, and then meeting up once again now that they are both in the Mountain West Conference. Paniolo Trophy, one of my favorite trophies. Like, to me, it's yeah. one of those unique ones, right? I mean, there are some wild trophies that exist across the landscape of college football, um, but it is very unique, right? I mean, it's cowboy, obviously, right? Not everybody local knows uh, the meaning of Paniolo, but to, to have that as a existing college football trophy, like to me, that was always kind of one of the cool ones. Oh yeah, no. And it's uh, a lot of times trophies are like tall and skinny. This thing is wide. It's like wide and fat. It's kind of like this big. If uh, people were, are able to watch it on YouTube or whatever, uh, they can see me moving my hands <laughs> like that. It's kind of this panoramic of uh, a cowboy chasing down a bull or something like that. Um, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's a work of art. <laughs> um, <laughs> pretty cool. Uh, I We've always enjoyed trying to go and compete for that. Um, who uh, Who actually is in possession of it right now, Jordan? Yeah, Wyoming. Wyoming, uh, oh, so. they've got the trophy, so. Not only can you end your season on a high note, right? Uh, it is a, a bit of a trip. Like I know some teams sort of spin it, right? If, uh, that's why Hawaii used to get some of those Power Five conference teams before the proliferation of conference championship games, right? They come out, play Hawaii as their 12th or 13th game. Teams on like probation. I remember Alabama uh, in the 2000s when they were ineligible for bowl games. They'd come out late in the season, right? It's like, oh, it's our bowl game. I don't know if you can quite spin a trip to Laramie on Thanksgiving weekend as like a bowl game possibility, uh, but it is a chance to hit the road with your guys one last time. And uh, there's a trophy at the end of the rainbow. If you can go bring it home, right? You, maybe they'll book an extra seat to get that thing back to Honolulu if that's the case. So yeah, but, but um, Wyoming in possession so far uh, as they hold the all time series advantage as well. I think it's like 15 to 10 all time mm. uh, in the 25 meetings. So. Big opportunity, though, for Hawaii. It is a Wyoming team that is now 6-5. and five. They secured bowl eligibility last week with a big win in Logan against Utah State. The West Division is kind of up for grabs going into the final weekend of conference play. Uh, Wyoming season has been kind of wild. A 4-0 start. They lose four straight, so they were sitting at 4-4, four and four, and now they've won two of their last three to get back above 500 uh, at 6-5. and five. And so, I mean, I don't know if there's a little less pressure on them now that they've secured bowl eligibility, you know, maybe they relax a little bit. You could make the argument that they'll play a little freer against Hawaii. I, I don't know if there's really much to that, but they do at least have a bowl game in their back or at least bowl eligibility in their back pocket at worst at six and six. Yeah. Um, I think it's tough for us. Uh, we, we've talked about this throughout the year. Uh, it was always going to be tough for us, regardless of our standing as a team going into Laramie at the end of the year. I just looked up, uh, the weather for this coming Saturday, we're recording this on Tuesday. Uh, there's a low of 31 and a high of 55. So it's not ridiculously cold. Um, depending on if that, you know, raises or drops, it could potentially affect things, but it doesn't look like it's um, going to be all that affecting of uh, the game. Uh, we've definitely played in colder. Uh, so as long as uh, you've got your, your long sleeves on, you should be more than fine. So um, 
Yeah, I'm 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 curious to see uh, what happens here, Jordan. I mean, if they're really averaging 200 on the ground, um, that's pretty impressive uh, for a running attack week in week out to put up those kind of numbers. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm hopeful that our offense can kind of ride the wave of, um, yeah, momentum heading into Laramie this weekend. So we'll see what Hawaii can uh, muster up against these Cowboys. It's kind of your usual Craig Bull uh, led team. He's now been to four or will now go to four bowl games uh, there in Wyoming. They love to run the football. They average over 200 yards on the ground, about 202 to be exact. They're pretty balanced offensively. They played a couple of quarterbacks. Levi Williams um, seems to be their guy as of late played very well against Utah state last weekend. And so this is a, a, a defense for Hawaii that will well be once again tested against a good rushing team, kind of like San Diego State, kind of like UNLV, kind of like Colorado State. Like a lot of these teams that have come in have been run first teams. And I think Wyoming is another team that absolutely presents a similar blueprint uh, against this Hawaii defense. And and for Hawaii's defense, like this is a group that we talked about, right? They, they could finish in the top five nationally in takeaways, in defensive touchdowns. And at the end of the day, that's, that's not a bad, uh, not a bad little feather in the cap if this defense can finish off on a high note in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the Hawaii fan base would agree with me that we would uh, wish that that was more reflective in our overall record. <laughs> I mean, it's it's all you know, fun and games to have uh, a national uh, ranking for certain categories, but I mean, we're in the bottom of the West Division. That is unacceptable. We're behind UNLV. We're behind San Jose, the San Diego States, the Fresno States. They, they've got great programs right now, but we are in <laughs> DFL dead freaking last of our side of the mountain West. And if we are trying to put our program on that next level, you know, at the beginning of the year, Jordan, people were even asking, was there ever a chance that we would join the PAC 12? Not if we can't win the mountain West, we've got a long way to go guys. So I look at that before anything else, because that's truly reflective of our team. Yeah. Our defensive unit might be good, but our offense was horrendous this year. So I'm hoping our guys can end on a high note and somehow turn this thing towards looking positively towards next season. Yeah. And, and so I, I think that's a nice segue into kind of how we wanted to wrap up this week's discussion in the big picture, right? Because you feel a little better about yourself after the Colorado state win. Right. I, I don't think that. We didn't lay a goose egg, it, you know, right. You know, you, that shouldn't be taken away from the group. They came out, they performed well and, and taking nothing away from them. We'll see if they can follow it up. But at the end of the day, you're going to, you're going to most likely miss out on a bowl game. Like there is a very slim chance you get to six and seven. There aren't enough bowl eligible teams out there. Mm -hmm and you get to a bowl game, it, it, it would feel a little weird, right? The way the season has played out when half your wins come against New Mexico State and Portland State. And so, like, if they get there, they get there, right? I, I think, you know, hopefully they get some support from, from the fan base and whatnot because it would likely be in the Hawaii Bowl. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that's a conversation. If we get there, we can have that conversation. I don't know if we really need to dive into, like, all the possibilities, uh, the way that they would backdoor their way in. But that, that is the, the grander scheme, right? It's going to be a losing record it's going to be a season where offensively like they could go out and score another 50. They're not going to average near 30 points a game for the season. It's a season that brought with it a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, what, what's the future of the program going to look like when you struggle in the way that you have. And look, we've, we've gone over all the built-in excuses, right? The, the stadium COVID lack of fan, all, all of that stuff. That, that's all true. That's all fair. Um, but the reality is going forward, like you got to win football games and you got to be able to recruit guys to this place, even though you're behind the eight ball and you also got to be able to keep guys. And so just today, as we record this, at least I, I believe it was, the, I don't know if it was the last late, late last night, but I saw it this morning. Um, you know, Kai Kaneshiro starting safety on this team with an ominous tweet, right? All it said was 24 out. And I think a lot of people took it as, out as in he is out of the program or leaving the program. I don't know if it meant that, you know, he was on the plane and they're out to Laramie. Like, you know, it was a little, little ambiguous. 
Uh, but you do have a guy like True Edwards, right? Uh, wide receiver who came in, was on the two deep early in the season. Uh, he entered the transfer portal a couple of weeks ago. And so that's not unique to Hawaii. Like you got a guy like Micah Pittman over at Oregon who was starting for the number three team in the country at wide receiver. He leaves the program a week ago. And so like, it, it, this isn't just a situation faced by Hawaii in, in where they are at. Like this, this happens all over the place, but it is a reality that they have to face. And so Hunter, I guess, big picture, what do you see going forward and, and kind of short-term, long-term question, but you know, how impactful is a game like the Wyoming game on Saturday? How impactful can that final game be in influencing whether guys decide to, to, return to Hawaii, run it back, or guys decide to seek opportunities elsewhere? Yeah, it, it will all come down to if those guys that are, you know, still have time left on their eligibility clock, if they feel like this place is a right fit for them, how's their relationship with their position coach? How's their relationship with head coach Todd Graham? All of those things uh, come into play in this last game. And uh, just some things that I've, you know, heard and observed with this team. Um, not all of the local guys feel all that seen or appreciated by this Howley coach from the mainland. Um, so this announcement from Kai Kanashiro, obviously a local boy uh, from out here, does not come as a surprise to me whatsoever. Um, I think the the people that transfer from our team are probably going to be more um, – some of the local guys uh, just because of how differently this guy runs our team. And it wasn't sort of the Hawaii football that they were uh, hoping to be a part of. So uh, I'm inter interested to see uh, how kind of coach Graham tries to uh, cling a little bit and uh, maybe, maybe schmooze to keep guys here because it's a, uh, I don't think it's a very good situation in that locker room right now. Um, however, I, you know, I say all of that because I, I understand the, the climate with, uh, with transferring, but if by chance there are young kids out there listening to this podcast, I wanted to encourage you. If you got an opportunity, like a kid like Kai Kaneshiro did, local boy was given a full ride scholarship to come play for university of Hawaii. I understand if it's maybe not a good fit for you, but you need to remember not everybody that plays for University of Hawaii gets to go play at the next level. I think sometimes local kids out here get a bigger head on their skill or their ability than what it actually is. Just because you're playing at University of Hawaii doesn't mean you're going to start at another Division I program somewhere on the mainland. And so I don't really appreciate the way that this guy, Kai, has uh, said that he's transferring right here with just a simple tweet, 24 out. You're not LeBron James show a little bit more love and appreciation to the people that gave you an opportunity. I know you may be upset, um, but where are you going to go right now? You got one more game before the end of the year. It's kind of a slap in the face to the rest of your guys just to kind of flex your, I don't know, transfer muscle, if you will. Check this out. I'm transferring. You know, finish out the year. You got one more game for love and respect to your guys. I mean, it's not like you're going to the school this week. Um, finish it out and do it the right way. I don't know. Does that make sense, Jordan? No, it does. It does. And, and especially when, you know, you only got one week left, right? It, it's really and less than a week left. He's been exposed. Sorry. Like he's been yeah. flat out exposed at safety several times. I know he's, you know, made some good plays, but it's not like we're, it's not like a Corey Bethley situation right here where maybe he could jump from here to, you know, a power five with the sort of uh, reputation he's built over here. Uh, Kai Kanashiro in some ways was a liability for us back there um, on a lot of, a lot of passing plays. So I don't know. It's just like, okay, go <laughs> in, in my book. Yeah. That, it, it, it's really tough. Right. And, and, you know, you could talk about commitment and, and what it means in this day and age and everything. And, and yeah. so, yeah, it's just, it's a little tough for me as well when when you're looking at the the timing of the situation where it's like, hey, yeah. look, you're coming off of a, a pretty exciting win on senior night. We honored a lot of your guys, right? A lot of your teammates, and and really, you've got five days left in the season. Five days. Um, yeah. You know, you can feel free to let us know after that, and and feel free to to offer a little bit more after that. 
or or just move on right if that's the case but but yeah the the, the timing of it is isn't great i, I would have some turkey on thanksgiving sleep on yeah it, yeah know? take take the week man take the week you know it doesn't doesn't have to be something there so yeah it's it's a little tough it's a little tough for me as well so so we'll, we'll see how that all plays out and and as we kind of run up against the end of this thing, we'll have a much deeper conversation, um, you know, going forward in the coming weeks. Uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a lot of time with no games on the schedule left, you know, no yeah. bowl game to look forward to. We, we assume uh, to really get into this and, and there, we got some comments and some, some, some questions on particularly our YouTube um, uh, feed from last week that, that I think brought up some really good points. And I, and I thought would probably be more pertinent uh, to have a deeper conversation after the season is done. So, so we'll look forward to that in a couple of weeks for, for those who took the time out to comment. We, we, we do appreciate it, but kind of wanted to let everybody know. I think, I think we can have a, a more fruitful discussion in, instead of trying to squeeze it in at the end, which we usually do here. Um, so uh, as we transition out of this thing, Hunter, did, did you have uh, any comments for our overtime segment um, before we say aloha to everybody and uh, start uh, before I got to put my turkey in the oven? Yeah. Um, heading into rivalry week for the rest of college football season, this could be the greatest Michigan versus Ohio state game mm. in my lifetime. Definitely. Um, with both of them in the top 10 and fighting for a chance for the big tens representation in the final four. Um, in that same vein with Oregon going down, our boys at Cincinnati are looking strong, Jordan looking strong, heading into potentially being the first group of five in the final four that is just phenomenal news yeah i, I can't wait and i and i know you've got ties to oklahoma and and bedlam is going to be pretty important as well yeah, for oklahoma too. state yes uh perhaps in particular and, and mike gundy saying you know once oklahoma leaves uh he doesn't know if the rivalry is going to continue it's kind of like what we saw with texas and texas a&m and that is one of like the biggest bummers to me and that'll mm -hmm. be my overtime contribution is is the conference realignment breaking up all these great rivalries, right? Texas, Texas A&M, maybe Bedlam, uh, backyard brawl with Pitt and West Virginia after Pitt yeah. went to the ACC. West Virginia went on their way to the Big 12. Like, I don't know. It, it, like, some of these things should be almost be mandated by, like, the college football powers that be. And I'm not one for, you know, forcing teams into doing whatnot, but, like, money, right? It just ruins everything, all these teams trying to – power grab and get to bigger conferences and bigger paydays and all this kind of stuff what was Ooh. gundy the one that said that yeah he he said somebody asked him if he thought that that bedlam would continue after oklahoma leaves for the sec and he's he basically said like you know just the way that things kind of work out like he'd be surprised if it did uh i think he said he hopes it does but but he said you know it just practically speaking right like it my it, response you know, to gundy would be put a team on the field against uh, Oklahoma and keep them in the big 12. They've owned the big 12 for the last That's however true. many years. That's true. And you know what? They, they, they Hey, I'm sure the cop, the pokes fans out there, right? It's like, Hey, maybe after Saturday, they'll have, uh, I would they'll love have, to see that. I would right? love That'd be to see funny. it. That'd be they, kind of funny. Yeah, my, my family lives in Oklahoma. Oklahoma state has the rap of being the ugly stepchild of Oklahoma. So I, I would love nothing better for the pokes actually to get it done this week. So, um, and my, my buddy Drew Brown uh, was an ex OK State quarterback. Yeah, that's right. So, that's right. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, I'm rooting for the Pokes this weekend. I really am against my little brother. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it is. Uh, rivalry is the best. I, I'm with you on that. So uh, we'll uh, we'll head out Hawaii, a little rivalry game of their own uh, as they battle Wyoming for the Paniolo Trophy. We'll be back next week to recap all of that. And then start getting into the offseason discussions and see where this program is heading over the next several months with the early signing day looming as well. Uh, Going to be a big indicator as to what the direction is for Todd Graham and his squad. Again, this has been Hawaii Football Now pre presented by Xanthason. Mahalo also to Spectrum Mobile. Uh, be sure to hit us up on Facebook, YouTube. Again, we got some really good comments. We're kind of keeping that uh, on the burner for the next couple of weeks. You can hit me up at Jordan Haley on Twitter, Hunters at All Around Athlete. Hunter, have a great Thanksgiving, man. We'll catch up soon. You too, brother. You've been listening to Hawaii Football Now with Jordan Haley and Hunter Hughes, all from ESPN Honolulu.